The Final Fantasy Avalanche is about to begin, and oh boy am I ready. It's Jordan here from Switchwatch, and this is the review of Final Fantasy IX. Just to give you a bit of backstory with my history with Final Fantasy IX and the series in general, I think it's important to get that out there for such a well-loved entry. I've always been a bit ambivalent towards Final Fantasy IX. I really wanted to love it, but when I played it when I was like 11, it just didn't gel with me. And believe me, I have given it plenty of shots over the years with my PlayStation, then when it released on PSP, PS3 and Vita. I've tried so many times, but I've held it rather low in my list of favourite Final Fantasies. My favourite has always been 7, followed by 10, then 6, 8, 5, and then maybe 9. I've always felt like I've been missing out when many people proclaim 9 to be the best in the series. I yearned to have that same feeling as everyone else, as deep down, I'm a very positive person when it comes to video games. Don't laugh. And I consider Final Fantasy to be a series that has had a major impact on me as a gamer. When Final Fantasy IX was announced for Switch, I knew it was now or never. This was the last shot for me to try and feel the same love as everyone else. If the Switch release couldn't convince me, then I would try no more. Let's see how that's turned out. The story of Final Fantasy IX begins as an airship, home to a travelling theatre troupe, lands in Alexandria. Among the ragtag crew is Zidane, or Zidane however you want to pronounce it, our lead protagonist for this entry. He's cocky, sassy, but also a very good guy, despite being a criminal. Yes, this theatre troupe is just a facade for the real plans to kidnap Princess Garnet, heir to the throne of Alexandria. The plan is simple, while the play is going on, to distract everyone Zidane and his best friend will sneak into the castle to take her. It all seems to be going smoothly until one small unexpected twist happens. The princess wants to escape the castle anyways. After much confusion between the princess, Zidane who is dressed as a guard, the queen's captain Steiner and the little black mage called Vivi, the airship straggles away, fleeing with everyone on board. It's a great opening for sure, one of the more memorable in the series and an intrigue that follows shortly after as the four enter a peculiar village and then onto a rival kingdom's capital city, it sets up an interesting story. You'll find out why Garnet wanted to leave as well as uncover malicious intentions from her mother and beyond. I like it. The writing is fantastic and the interactions between characters are great. The way Zidane talks differently to Princess Garnet and then Vivi and then Steiner shows that he has a lot of nuance to his character. And these four characters are some of the more memorable that the series has to offer. And I've always thought that. The problem I have is that that's just half of the cast. You will get four more characters along the way, but they don't hold a candle to the first four. Sure, they have their moments, but Zidane, Garnet, Vivi and Steiner are classic. It's not like Final Fantasy 7 or 10 where every character is iconic. The rest of the cast feel tacked on, and that may be a controversial opinion. I'm sure many people love Aiko or Amaranth, but for me, I'm just really apathetic towards them. The overarching story as a whole leaves less of an impact compared to other entries too. It feels more quaint as this entry reverts back to the medieval style fantasy rather than the higher tech ones that surrounded it. Still, it's a very enjoyable story in the grand scheme of things and while it does have some tangents or long winded segments, it's well worth investing your time into to soak up that great amount of world building put into it. I'm not going to go overly in detail with the gameplay because it's just simple JRPG affair. You walk around towns, advance the story, go into the overworld, enter some dungeon type areas and fight random monster encounters in turn based battles. Even at this point in the long running series, Final Fantasy has always kept it fairly simple until the previous entry which had you drawing magic. So if you've played any JRPG before, you'll know exactly how this game and their battles play out. Where Final Fantasy IX succeeds in my opinion is that it's far more tactical than your average game of the genre. One of the things I originally hated about this game was that the battles were so slow. But as an impatient little boy, of course I did. Playing it now, I can see that even your average random encounter can present a few issues if you're not careful, especially with their status effects. The fact that in your early party group you have just two physical attackers, one white mage and one black mage means that you just can't spam the attack button because you don't have the power to do so. 
You have to use your abilities more wisely and item usage is more important than it's ever been in the series. At least that's what I think. It strikes the perfect difficulty balance too. It's tough at times and you will feel like you're constantly up against it as even the smaller monsters don't pull any punches. But you'll get through it with tactical prowess and ample usage of recovery items. Unfortunately, the original version certainly had its quirks that impacted it in my opinion. Firstly, yes, the battles were slow, but as a British person, I was subjected to the PAL version of the game, which ran even slower. While its difficulty was balanced enough, you would probably die once in a while, and because save points could potentially be missed if you choose the wrong path, you may have to go a long way back if you die at an unfortunate time. Time between save points can be horrendous, and you can even have to go through multiple boss battles before you get to another save point. At the time, this was not a game you could just pick up and play at any point. I often checked how long I was going between save points, and sometimes it was up to an hour, which is crazy. Thankfully, this port mitigates a lot of these issues. Obviously, this isn't a PAL conversion, so it's already a bit of a breath of fresh air for me. Plus, I think this port has been sped up in some of its processes itself, although the black loading screen for battle transitions still feels unacceptably long. One of the features of this port is that it includes a fast forward feature. If you press start and then the R button, everything will become super fast. Sadly, this can't be accessed during the black screen transition when it's needed the most by far, but after the battle does load and the camera swoops around cinematically for far too long, you can use it then. There is a continue feature which is an absolute godsend. Basically, if you die, you're sent right back to the title screen, which is pretty much standard for the series and the time. Now, that can be infuriating and soul crushing if you saved ages back and lost a ton of progress. Thankfully, if you just click that continue button on the title screen, you'll pop right back up just before where you died. This came in handy for me during the ice cavern, which is pretty early on, where there is a fork in the road right at the end of the dungeon. One of the paths leads to a save point, one leads to the boss. It's basically a beginner's trap and I died on the boss and having last saved at the beginning of the dungeon, I was kind of worried. But thankfully the continue feature saved my bacon. There are other features added to this edition to make it more accessible. I only really used the two mentioned before, but there are assists such as no random encounters, all your attacks do 9,999 points worth of damage, and also one which means you don't have to wait for your timing meter to go up. These ones can be turned on or off on a whim, but there are three more power-ups that once turned on can't be disengaged. These are allowing you to instantly master abilities without having to learn them using equipment, leveling up your party to 99, and also giving you maximum dosh. I feel all of these additions are pretty much overkill as they will definitely take a bit of an edge off the game, but it's great for those who just want to observe the story rather than sift through the battles. One thing not able to be changed is the trance ability given during battle. This is basically when you turn superhuman after you've taken a beating too many times. Your character will go super saiyan for a few rounds with increased attack power and new abilities to extract revenge on the foes. On paper, it's fine. The series is well known for these type of battle gimmicks and they pretty much all work well. Final Fantasy IX's trance mode is a complete wet fish though. You have zero control over when it happens, as it just does it automatically. You can't call it in whenever you're ready, so it mostly occurs at incredibly inconvenient times. Maybe it will happen just as the battle ends, or perhaps when you desperately need to heal the character rather than attack, or maybe when you've already chosen which ability you want to use. It just wastes the precious time you have with it. It's ill thought out. I'm not sure why a simple limit break feature couldn't have been implemented instead. While many people dislike Final Fantasy VIII for various reasons, not a single person on this earth can deny that the minigame known as Triple Triad was the greatest gift that Square had ever given. For the sequel, they tried to emulate that success and then dial it up to the next level in Tetra Master. Unfortunately, it's absolutely awful. Who knows what went wrong, but we have such a convoluted random mess that it's best avoided completely. I know it seems nitpicky, but how could they make something so unbelievably amazing into something so terrible? Speaking of which, why did Square never release a standalone triple triad game? That could have been great. Anyways, overall in terms of gameplay, this port has made what was often a frustrating time into something far more lovable for me. I'm more mature and can appreciate the more tactical approach to the fighting, and the streamlined, more consumer-friendly approach to this HD version really opened my eyes to what a great game this is. It may be simple in terms of the battle system, but that's made up for in using all your abilities and items wisely. I really 
really like the tactical nature to this one. Nobuo Uematsu is a legend. Even as a young kid, I could hear the step up in quality he had over other game composers of the time. He made pieces of art, not just background noise to play along with. I must admit Final Fantasy IX is one of the soundtracks that I have listened to the least over the years due to having less affinity with this entry, but this time I felt I had to play with headphones on just to soak it all in and oh my word, it's magical. There's lots of European medieval influence, of course, especially in the main theme, but it's not overpowering. Uematsu's trademark chipper and playful styles found in previous games comes through very strongly still, and of course you have the utterly beautiful emotion cannons like Melodies of Life and Garnet's theme. It's truly a very beautiful soundtrack and I underestimated it originally. In this port it sounds so crisp and clear too. Please play this game with headphones on, I implore you. So Final Fantasy IX is an original PlayStation game and that comes with a few issues when it comes to transitioning to a HD console. Firstly, it's not widescreen, which I feel is a big shame. I know that's the way it was designed and viewpoints outside of the field of view probably weren't even drawn. So if they did want to convert it to widescreen, it would have needed a major reworking. It's understandable, but a shame. Instead, you have a gradient border, which I'm not sure if you could turn on or off. I couldn't find the option in the menus. What is good news, however, is that the game's character models have been redone in higher definition, and I think they look fantastic. Compared to the gritty originals, these are surprisingly detailed and look better than some of the lower budget RPGs out there today. I really think they look better than something like I Am Setsuna. Another thing that's held up surprisingly well are the FMV cutscenes. They look really good and far better than I remember. The ones used here are probably in the original resolution before they had to be scaled down for the PlayStation. What hasn't held up so well are the pre-rendered backgrounds that the game uses. I mean, they do kind of look pretty terrible. And you can clearly see they are from another era as they are far, far too blurry for big TVs these days. Still, the art style holds up really well and I'm kind of ashamed of the far more snooty 11 year old me who, after playing the cooler near future style of Final Fantasy 7 and 8, considered this to be a downgrade or even boring. Now I'm a little more mature, I appreciate it far, far more. And the medieval design and a bit of steampunk thrown in is fantastic. It especially looks wonderful in handheld mode where the more compact screen helps alleviate the backgrounds a lot. And I spent about 90% of my time in handheld mode out of personal choice. It just felt so right and I did not notice the blurry backgrounds at all. Now when this port was stealth dropped after the Nintendo Direct, I saw many people moaning about the $20 price tag. Are you mental? Final Fantasy IX is a quality game, not only that, but it's been enhanced and improved over the original. It has a fantastic lengthy story, depth, unbelievable music and is worth it, no question. If you look at any other JRPG on the Nintendo Switch currently, very few will give you this quality for this price tag. I mean just look at Lost Sphere for example, a pretty mediocre RPG for $50. Or Shining Resonance which is half decent but again $50. Final Fantasy IX is one of the best JRPGs on the system for one of the lowest prices. Don't complain guys, just because you bought it before on other systems doesn't mean it should be automatically be priced lower here. It is worth it. Before we get into my final thoughts, don't forget to hit that subscribe button for all our latest greatest Nintendo Switch content. It's well worth it guys, I promise we're going to review all of the Final Fantasy games, well at least I'm going to try, so stay tuned for that. Thank you Nintendo Switch, you have done what the PlayStation, the PSP, PS3 and Vita all failed to do. You managed to convince me that Final Fantasy IX is a great game. At the time, I felt it was a quick stopgap on a dying console while Square put all their main effort into getting Final Fantasy X ready for the PlayStation 2. That was doing it an injustice however, as I now realise it's just as lovingly crafted as all the other Final Fantasy games I hold so close. Playing the PAL version really hindered my enjoyment of it, but this Switch port has fixed so many issues. It's not perfect of course, while the main story is enjoyable and the writing some of the best the series has to offer, half of the cast are a bit dull, and yes the battle transitions still take too long, but I think it plays better than ever, and thanks to the assists found in this port, it's the most accessible way of playing it by far. 
I'm so happy this came to the Nintendo Switch and even to this day as a JRPG Final Fantasy 9 holds up remarkably well as one of the best on the system. It's a 9 out of 10. Did you guys pick up Final Fantasy 9 or not? We would love to know. Leave us a comment below. If you're interested in JRPGs, we must admit we don't cover too many on this channel, but head over to check out our review of Lost Sphere or maybe Earthlock, which is actually very reminiscent of Final Fantasy 9. So I'll see you guys over there. Take care. Tetra Master sucks though.